Okay, so we're going back to um, multivariate or multivoxel pattern analyses. And again, the core idea that we talked about last class is that we can think of fMRI data in a new format, a sort of just a different mathematical way to think about the data that we collect, where each beta that we measure for a given condition, we can now think of as a point in the space of voxels for some set of voxels. And then we talked about how once you think about the data that way, a bunch of different operations become possible and relevant and useful. And so what we're going to talk about today are things you can do from here. In particular, as I just said, we'll go over again a little bit classification. Then we'll talk about generalization. And then we'll talk about representational dissimilarity matrices. So all things, which is a based on, as we said, based on distance, these are all things that you can do with the data once you've thought about them in this form. But as we also said last time, before you can do that, you need to ask which voxels are we going to do this analysis in, right? How are we going to choose the voxels that we're using to then do everything else? And I realized, so by you know 3 or 4 o'clock yesterday, I was losing it in terms of mental coherence and working memory and everything. So I realized that I had not been clear about the difference between two, two importantly different functions that you do in choosing which voxels. So we choose voxels in which to do multivariate pattern analyses for two reasons, which are important, but it, it's useful to think about them separately. And that was the first thing I want to do is clarify that difference. So we choose voxels for two reasons. One is because, because of a question about what is the relevant unit of analysis in the brain, right? So that was when we were talking about, for some purposes, you don't want to know whether you can classify this from the brain. You're trying to ask about the information processing capacity of a, of a part of the brain or a system in the brain, right? So, and that's different from, which we will also talk about, statistical reasons for choosing features, which is about the, the noisiness of features and the dangers of overfitting. But so let's separate those two as two different claims, because the, although we choose features for both reasons, I think it's important to know that those are two different reasons serving two different purposes. Right? So the first thing is a question about when we're asking, is there information about some distinction somewhere, right? somewhere in the brain? We're usually, as we said, not asking the question about the brain. We're using, usually asking the question about some subset of the brain. And there's two main possible ways you might think of these subsets. One is a local region, right? And again, that's related to ideas like the idea that a patch of cortex is an area with a function, and we want to characterize that function. So for some purposes, what we're trying to do is find that little local bit of brain whose function we are trying to characterize. And you can think of that on the examples we talked about yesterday as an anatomical region, like the amygdala, or a functionally defined region, like the FFA. But in either case, what we're thinking of is within this whole big complicated brain, there's a sub-region, and we're interested in its function, its computational power. OK, and, so the, and when you do the kind of searchlight we talked about, where you iteratively look for information in each searchlight that you move all the way around the brain, you're again looking for local information. right? So you do it all over the brain. But in each position, what you're asking about is, is there local information here in the voxels that neighbor each other right here that, that can be used to make some classification? Again, I think that find that intuitive if you think about the brain as made up of areas or regions, right? So if you think that the way the cortex is organized is that there are local neural populations that work together as a population to encode some feature space, then it's interesting to, once you've found that population in whatever way, ask what feature space it encodes. So this idea that we would be interested in 
local sets of features, that doesn't come from statistics or machine learning. That comes from cognitive neuroscientists with an idea of what set of voxels are interesting to study together. Right? Another possibility you could imagine, um, and this happens too, right, is that we're not interested in a local region. We're interested in um, a functionally defined network, for example. So here the question is, it doesn't matter that these voxels are actually contiguous to one another, but we think that they are related to one another. So again, the simplest version you could imagine of this is the two hemispheres, right? So we might be interested in what information is in the amygdala, but not only the right amygdala, also the left amygdala. So then we might take all the voxels in the right amygdala, all the voxels in the left amygdala, and use those all together as one population. So this is just to say it's not necessarily about contiguity, it's about some belief that there's a functional population worth studying together that creates that functional constraint on the relevant set of voxels as a unit of analysis, right? Does this make sense as an idea? And that is different from a third idea, which is that information could be completely non-local, right? So there could be some information, and quite possibly there's lots of information in the brain, that you can only classify if you're drawing voxels from many different parts of the brain, right? Like you have one voxel here, one voxel there, one voxel there. But none of the methods that we talked about uh, yesterday, none of the feature selection methods we talked about are looking for that kind of thing. That there are people who want to do that, and that's a different approach. So for now, what we're thinking about is usually MVPA within some spatially constrained or functionally constrained unit of analysis within the brain. Does that make sense? And so one role of feature selection is to find and pick groups of voxels that we think are a functional unit of analysis, of which it is interesting to ask, what features does it represent or classify? Now, there's a second reason that we do feature selection, which is that as you have more noisy dimensions, increase the risk of overfitting. So what that means is, in this multidimensional voxel space, right, when we learn from our training data, how, wh whatever it is, distance or the classification boundary, and we'll go into that, you want to be learning on a signal that's a real signal, not on noise. And so adding noise into this kind of analysis by adding voxels whose signal is all noise makes the answer worse. It makes it less able to generalize to the new tests. So this is the statistical or machine learning reason for feature selection, which says you need to select of the set of voxels you're considering as the population, basically what you need to do is drop the ones that are likely to be mostly noise, right? And so that what you include when you do your analysis is more likely to have signal and less likely to have noise. And that gives you a better chance that whatever, for example, classification you learn in the training set will generalize to the test set because we expect the signal to still be present in the test set, but not the noise. Right. OK, and so this reason for overfitting, this reason for, for feature selection, um, is part of why people would be, so when I said there's, there's kind of two strategies, and I was trying to lay them out, part of what was confusing there is that, in general, when people are using a contrast, for feature selection, it's because they're mostly thinking of this function, right? They're mostly thinking of feature selection as picking voxels that have some function. When they're using some neutral SNR criterion, they're mostly thinking of this function. But actually, and this is where I was confusing yesterday, is once you realize you're trying to achieve those two functions, you can use one, st one procedure and, but try to apply it in a way that achieves both goals once you realize that that's what you're trying to do. And so where, for example, our lab's procedure has come to is thinking about what would one feature selection process look like that successfully both sampled from a relevant population of voxels and was more likely to pick voxels that contained signal than noise. If the number of data points you have is large relative to the number of dimensions, then you hope that eventually you can tell the difference between um, meaningful dimensions and noisy dimensions. 
The danger is, as is often the case in fMRI, we have many dimensions and not that many data points. And so in the training sample, it can be hard to tell the difference between noise and signal. And just from the distribution of the data points in that space itself. And so we are often are trying to use some other clue that a dimension is truly noise before we include it in the analysis. Yeah, so the in the in the case of infinite data points, you should be able to tell that an SVM won't learn a classification along a dimension that's only noise. That dimension won't appear diagnostic. What overfitting is, is the danger that because we don't have infinite data, a non-diagnostic dimension looks diagnostic um, because noise can, it, can generate apparently large differences between conditions. And so if we know in advance that that dimension is mostly noise, then we don't want to even try to fit it. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Another thing that um, you guys asked is for either of these purposes, um, how do we set what number? of voxels we're going for, right? So I said that there's a practice in the field that seems to me that it's around 80 to 100 voxels. Um, and you guys said, where does that number come from and how could we fit it? Um, and so I was talking to Stefano about that last night as well. Um, and it turns out that at least some people um, present their data analyzed as a function of the number of features. And so one way to get around the fact that at the moment, this number can be arbitrary is instead to just do your analysis at a, a whole range of that number and present all possible outcomes, right? Just present the function of classification as a function of the number of features. Um, and certainly, so again, this is credit to Stefano for, for helping me through, through this yesterday. Um, while we are still figuring out all the parameters of MVPA such that in each experiment in a different brain region with a different number of trials and a different everything, um, there's no sense that the answer to how many features is the right feature for one, one experiment will be the same answer as for another experiment. And so the, the trade-off between having enough non-redundant features to capture the thing you're interested in, but not having too many noise features that leads to overfitting, right? That's the trade-off. You're trying to find the sweet spot where you have enough features to see the structure you're interested in, but not so many features that you have tons of overfitting in your feature space, somewhere in the middle of that trade-off is the right number. And again, because each project you do, you might be working in a new system no one's ever worked in before with you know, different numbers of trials per condition and a different feature selection method and so on. It seems like a good idea not to just assume that the answer to the right number of features from somebody else's experiment is going to be the right number of features in your experiment. Um, and so if there's a way Again, this raises a multiple comparisons problem, but if there's a way to look at your results as a function of the number of features, that's one way to get around picking a number in advance. So hopefully that clarifies some of the confusing stuff yesterday um, on the, the two different kind of modes of feature selection and what they have to do with one another. Um, and as I say, what we are thinking about usually in the lab these days is using a broad anatomical constraint, which is designed to make sure that we're looking at something like a local region or a functional network. And then from within that, picking features by an SNR type criterion to avoid overfitting. So that's, inst that's been our, instead of what used to be a kind of functional ROI, which set, but which did both at the same time, right? So we would use a contrast value to do both pick the ROI and therefore define all the features, right? All the voxels in the ROI. We've sort of moved to using a, a more general anatomical definition to define the region we're interested in and not a contrast, some kind of SNR measure to define the, the features. Not always, but sometimes, just to give a sense of how that might work. <laughs>